is Indian country today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Tholohungva. Here are the headlines for Thursday, October 22nd. Republicans are advancing Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court nomination despite a boycott from Democrats. Democrats protested the Senate Judiciary Committee vote today, which sets up Barrett to be sworn into office by the full Senate as soon as Monday. Judge Barrett's confirmation will guarantee a 6-3 conservative majority in the country's highest court. Indian country leaders are concerned about that majority, saying it could have detrimental implications for tribal nations. A conservative majority could impact a wide range of topics important to Indian country, such as voting rights, the environment, and health care access, to name a few. In our coverage of Native Vote 20, Indian Country Today is following the races of 14 Native American candidates running for Congress from both parties. A few are incumbents running for a re-election, but most are hoping to sit in Congress for the first time, like Republican Joe Akana, who is Native Hawaiian. Hawaii is a blue state, voting for Clinton in 2016 and voting for Obama in 2012. If elected, Akana would be the second Native Hawaiian in Congress since statehood. Joe Akana faces off against Democrat and fellow Native Hawaiian Kai Kahele for the congressional seat. And while many people are experiencing pandemic fatigue, positive COVID-19 cases are on the rise and Native Americans continue to be among the hardest hit by the virus. Earlier this week, we told you about the outbreaks California tribes are experiencing right now even as infection rates for California as a whole are trending downwards. Tribes in Arizona, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin are also facing high infection rates. COVID-19 cases are surging in Arizona, reaching levels that haven't been seen since June. The state is close to averaging 1,000 new cases each day. The Arizona Department of Health Services has a COVID-19 vaccination plan that allows tribes to decide who gets the vaccine in their communities. Arizona's surge began at the end of September and continues to climb, similar to the rest of the country. A Portland housing center for Native Americans is getting an award from the Urban Land Institute Terwingler Center for Housing. Nisika Ilahi, which means our place in the Chinook language, opened in 2020. It has 59 units of affordable housing, and the facility focuses on the acute needs of the Native community by including culturally specific services and medical, dental, and behavioral health care for all residents. The center was rewarded for its innovation in building technologies, quality of design, and for bringing together public and private partnerships. Last year, Nisika Ilahi received more than $17 million in grants. And that includes a key one from the Confederated Tribe of Siletz Indians. Char Tribal Chair Dolores Pigsley told Oregon Public Broadcasting that Portland has one of the largest per capita homeless populations in the country. And this new apartment complex is a way to address their needs. Well, NAACP leaders and students are calling for Seattle Public Schools Superintendent and MHA Nation citizen Denise Juno to be fired immediately. In a press conference, they pointed to her not doing enough to address systemic racism in the district. Juno, whose contract is up for renewal this year, has never been disciplined or faced formal complaints during her tenure. But students there say that there have been ongoing problems with racism. On October 5th, the NAACP Youth Council started a petition calling for Juno to be fired. Juno is the first Native American woman to lead the Seattle School District, the largest in the state with more than 53,000 students. It will be up to the school board to decide whether or not to extend her contract. A tribe in central Texas will soon be able to reclaim and rebury the remains of their ancestors. The Miyakan Garza Band is a state-recognized tribe. Remains of three of its people are currently being held at the University of Texas at Austin. Under the Native American Graves and Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990, museums and government institutions must create a public inventory of the Native American remains and cultural objects they have in order to return the remains to tribes. UT Austin has more than a thousand Native remains from all over Texas. The university initially refused the tribe's request to return the remains. However, after pressure from the indigenous community and UT students, the university recently agreed. Jay Hartzell, the university president, wrote in a letter, 
the university will promptly seek authority from the National Park Service to allow the remains identified in your letter to be reinterred. We plan to do so by requesting a recommendation from its Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act review committee that would enable us to offer the remains promptly for reburial. Despite this one victory, it's not the end of their fight. The tribe hopes to help other indigenous people in the state make repatriation requests to UT Austin. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today for Thursday, October 22nd. I'm Patty Thalongva. We'll be right back. Two years ago, there were a number of Native Americans running for prime state offices, including governor, lieutenant governor, and secretary of state. As Mark Trehunt reports, this election season, the list is a lot smaller. Representative Shane Morgeau, a citizen of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, was first elected to the Montana legislature in 2017. He quickly traveled from being a freshman legislator to one of the Democratic Party's leaders in the House. Morgeau is one of those politicians who works incredibly hard, and nearly a year ago he decided to run for state auditor, one of those statewide constitutional offices. I've been doing this for, for a while now, but I, I always had this perspective in my mind, you know, growing up in, in rural Montana where, you know, politicians show up, they ask you for something, call you and ask you for a donation or money or your support, and, uh, and then they disappear on you and, you, and you don't see them again. Morgeau talks to everyone he can throughout the year, Democrats, Republicans, independents. Before the pandemic took off, he put some 13,000 miles crisscrossing Montana. COVID may have changed everything, but not Morgeau's mission. Once in the legislature, he worked on two issues, a tribal water compact with the state and Medicaid expansion. And that experience was just like, wow, open my eyes. Like there are people who care about me and my community. Um, and the, the folks that always didn't waver in that support when it came to protecting people in my community with pre-existing conditions and um, stepping up to find, find a way to make sure people have access to health care. It was in the legislature that Morgeau saw the power of the insurance industry. I was serving in my second term in leadership. I you know, had the experience of even going another level of, of having um, an experience with companies and, and insurance companies that were the sole opposition to legislation I was carrying to extend the statute of limitations for child sex abuse victims. And so when I was looking at what I wanted to do after the legislature, um, I was a little bit discouraged by that, uh, but then talking with my wife about you know, how I can help people in Montana you know, my record of getting nine bills passed in Montana, being able to um, work and put, put aside partisanship, you know, be an independent voice um, and find common ground and common sense issues and, and to really, you know, find niches of people where I earn their trust and, and we can work together. We've got a lot of good stuff done. It's easy to see Montana and its natural beauty, rivers, lakes, trees, but Montana has another story to tell. It's a state where there is a culture that includes representation. The fact that Montana, you know, our legislature looks like our, you know, our um, population base, you know, the, the makeup of our, our population, you know, being around 7%, um, Indians being around 7% of the population in Montana, um, you know, our legislature um, looks like that, you know. And that's a good thing because I think when you have that representation, you know, it, a lot of the critical issues impacting our communities. I mean, I always look at it when Montana, when all of our communities are doing better, Montana, Montana is doing better, economy is doing better, um, the, the health of people across the state um, is better. And one of the things that I, I've, I've actually, the whole reason I ended up going to law school in Montana and staying here is because I knew that there would be a value in, in going to school and being in the, the working with the same people and going to school with the same people that I might work with someday. I had a clear record of working across the aisle there to get things done and um, to really 
promote the, the health and welfare of everybody in this, in the state. Um, you know, I really try to make, make sure people know that I am proud to be a Montanan. Um, and that we need to, to ensure that, you know, people recognize that natives in Montana are Montanans too, you know, and, and, um, that I take great pride in the fact that I'm a Montanan, that I'm a, a Salish and Kootenai uh, member, and that I'm a U.S. citizen. I, I, I take great pride in, in all of those. Um, and I wanna see our state and the people in the state uh, do better as well. And that's why I think I'm the best candidate just based on my background, where I come from. For Indian Country Today, I'm Mark Trahant. Eddie Chukula is a freelance journalist and he's been covering some political races for Indian Country Today. Welcome, Eddie. How you doing, Patty? Very good. It's been a busy season here and imagine, you know, it's just we're coming down to the wire here. So let's start with the first race that you covered recently uh, for uh, Ramey Bald Eagle. Yeah, he's running for a Public Utilities Commission in South Dakota as a Democrat. Uh, a statewide office, uh, non, not a tribal deal, but uh, he, uh, he faces a guy who's uh, been in there for uh, quite a while, like 15 or 20 years, uh, a Republican. And uh, he's hoping, uh, Ramey's hoping that uh, disenfranchised Republican voters will, uh, or independents will help him uh, swing that vote towards his side. And so he's, uh, he's campaigning up there and um, most likely will be the first Native American to hold that position if he's elected. Right. I don't know of uh, anyone else that's held that position other than, uh, uh, I mean, uh, as far as a, a statewide office, you know, it's like I said, it's non-tribal. And we're seeing more Native Americans uh, go into these offices that maybe they haven't tried it for before. You know, we're following other races where um, they're looking at a county assessor race, the state Supreme Court, things like that. So it's exciting to see all the different Native candidates running for political office across the country. Tell us about the congressional race you're covering in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, I'm covering, uh, I'm doing a, a feature for any country today on uh, District 2 which is uh, currently held by a Cherokee citizen, uh, Republican, Mark Wayne Mullen. He's going for his fifth straight uh, term, or their two-year terms. I don't know why they make him run every two years, but that seems like uh, an exhaustive process. Every, two, every time you turn around, you're going to be running again. But he's being opposed by another Cherokee citizen, Danielle Lanier, a Democrat, and uh, a, another Libertarian candidate. So two Cherokee citizens in this race. And, um, and that's, that makes that race a little more interesting to cover as well. And we're following that. Um, in, in, again, in the last uh, two years ago in the election, there were some Native Americans, such as in uh, Minnesota, where you had two Native women running for the office, which Peggy Flanagan won, and she's now lieutenant governor there in, in, a, in a Minnesota. So um, watching the Oklahoma race. Uh, and so how, uh, for the next week, uh, what will you be covering? Well, I'll be keeping an eye on Bald Eagle in South Dakota and uh, the uh, second district in Oklahoma. Uh, that's, for, that's all I'm covering right now. And does anything else stick out to you uh, for the race in Oklahoma? You know, uh, I, I think we're going to be guaranteed of, uh, you know, there are four uh, Native Americans in Congress right now. And I think that uh, with either Lanier or Mullen winning, there's going to hopefully be at least uh, at least four going into 2021. Wow. And so, again, following those races there. Um, and, and then looking at just the, uh, the number of Native Americans running across the country, uh, are you surprised to be seeing so many more Native Americans running uh, for different offices? Yeah, I am. And uh, I think it all uh, started with, uh, you know, two years ago when Sharice Davids pulled this big surprise uh, upset in Kansas that you know, opened a lot of eyes to where uh, Natives can, you know, can see that uh, instead of just depending on uh, non-Natives, to represent them in, in D.C. that uh, they can get out there and run themselves. Right. And so, again, considering your long career as a journalist and covering stories 
and political stories. It is interesting, you know, 20 years ago, you didn't see, you know, maybe one or two on the national scene. And today we're looking at more than 100 running for offices. Right. And that's, you know, it's coming a long way from uh, being, uh, not even being able to vote legally, you know. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully, that, you know, that continues. Right. Okay. Well, Eddie Chikolate, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Patty. And when we come back, we're going to hear from a Cowlitz man who is helping Netflix develop a new series with an all-native writing cast. We'll be right back. Humor is something that has sustained Native people for centuries and through so many tragedies and sadness. And so today, as we find our way through this pandemic, humor is once again sustaining us. Joey Cliff is Cowlitz, and he loved movies as a kid. Well, that love has taken him into the writing rooms for Nickelodeon and DreamWorks. For Indigenous Peoples Day, he partnered with Illuminatives to create a list of 25 Native American comedians to follow in 2020, which included a takeover of Comedy Central's Instagram account. Let's start by watching one of his most recent films here, and it's called Telling People You're Native American When You're Not Native is a lot like telling a bear you're a bear when you're not a bear. Telling people you're Native American when you're not Native is a lot like telling a bear you're a bear when you're not a bear. If you tell a bear you're a bear when you're not a bear, you will get mauled by that bear. Ah! If you wear the traditional clothing of a bear when telling a bear that you are also a bear, you'll get mauled by that bear. Ah! If you tell a bear you're one sixteenth bear, but you don't know what kind of bear, and you've never bothered to research your bear culture, and yet you think you have more right to an opinion about bear issues than the actual bear standing in front of you, you're going to get mauled by that bear. Ah! If you make products with a bear's face on it, and even though you've made a billion dollars off of it and the bear has clearly said they don't like it, and you don't give any of the money you've earned to bears in need until you're guilted into it decades after you started doing it, you and that bear are fine. Hey. Uh, Just kidding. You're going to get mauled by that bear. <laughs> if you tell a bear that lions are your spirit animal, you're going to get mauled by that bear. <laughs> and the lion. <laughs> If you, a non-bear, make friends with a bear, learn their bear culture and language, and then get mad when the bear doesn't ask you to be a member of their bear clan or give you a bear naming ceremony, you're going to get mauled by that bear. Also, bears don't have naming ceremonies, so that request is stupid. And if you tell people you're a bear, even though you know full well that you're not a bear just to get jobs and opportunities that are set aside for bears, you're going to get mauled by a butterfly. Huh? The bear would maul you, but he's in a business meeting. Wait, meeting's over. Hmm. Hey, I thought we were done. Ah! Ah! Ouch, though! So, in conclusion, if you're cool to Native Americans, you will not get mauled by a bear. The end. No white guys were harmed in the making of this short. That's us. Well, Joey's next adventure now includes joining the all-native writing room for Netflix's brand new animated series, Spirit Rangers. Welcome to our program, Joey. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm uh, so excited to uh, be on Indian Country today. I'm a big fan uh, and uh, sorry that my short film name is so long. It's like uh, the <laughs> Fiona Apple album title of short film names. It's 24 words long. <laughs> Well, and, and even the title is funny, right? You know, um, as, and we're, as we're looking at this pandemic and as we're talking about trying to get through the pandemic and using humor, how did your writing change in this pandemic? Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the pandemic has definitely been, you know, it's definitely had a big effect on, you know, a, a lot of things in the world. And, you know, probably the, the smallest on the list is uh, my writing process. I, um, the way that it's changed is... Um, uh, Prior to this, when I would be working on a show, I would, uh, you know, go into a writer's room, sit in an office, you know, usually uh, eat a lot of, uh, you know, free snacks from the office kitchen while, you know, cracking jokes in a room full of people. <laughs> and um, now, uh, instead of doing that, I do most of my writing just, you know, kind of at my apartment and most of my meetings are, you know, 
on Zoom or on some video chat. So um, there's a little bit more, uh, I would say that the way that my writing process has changed for meetings is now I am hyper aware of how messy my room is at any given time. So I'm just like, oh, that, that closet door's open. Oh, nobody should see that. Oh, my bed's messy. So uh, I would say that that's uh, become a big part of my writing process is making sure my, I don't look like a slob. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and everyone else who, who now have to Zoom from home here, and, uh, and isn't that true? You know, we, we don't realize how much we miss that uh, water cooler talk, you know, those little coffee breaks that we have when we're in an office with a lot of people. And, and um, I, I would imagine comedy writers especially really feed off of that energy of one another. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, it, it's so much of... Um... So much of us came up through kind of like live comedy spaces where we would do shows together and we would, you know, riff on stage and, you know, make an audience crack up. And uh, I, like it's it's still there over Zoom a little bit, but like sometimes we'll kind of accidentally step on each other's jokes just because there's like a latency and a lag. And um, uh, it's also different a little bit. Um, a lot of stand up shows and comedy shows are over video chat now. So it's kind of the same deal of like. Oh, instead of like driving to a comedy theater at midnight on a Tuesday to do a show, I'm just sitting in my dark room and just being like, I don't really want to go to bed right now, but I have to do this show. Wow, it, it, it's a very different world here. So you're going to be writing for Netflix's Spirit Ranger series. How is this production different from other Netflix series? Uh, so the way that this production is different from other Netflix series is that uh, for the first time ever, in the history of animated TV in the United States, it's an all native writer's room. And it's just a very, a very, you know, uh, like native forward show in kind of like how we look at, how I look at uh, all aspects of storytelling for the show. And, um, you know, it's, uh, I would say the way that it's different from a lot of other writing jobs that I've had. Um, usually when I'm working in rooms, uh, in writer's rooms, I'm the only native on staff. So because of that, and because, you know, as we know, it's like your average person probably doesn't know as much about natives as they might, maybe probably should. Um, Whenever I would pitch like native jokes, storylines, or anything like that to like a non-native writer's room, I would usually have to start every pitch by establishing first things first. Uh, I was born in a hospital, not a cave. My mom is not an eagle. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, because it's an all native writer's room, we can just kind of jump into it. Everybody knows what smudging is. Everybody knows what fry bread is. You know, we're all aware of like, you know, uh, like a, a lot of, um, you know, we're all aware of like, you know, a lot of like native lore and stuff like that. So we can just get to like the heart of the stories and the meat of like what, uh, you know, what makes these stories great. So, you know, I think that that's something that uh, I really, you know, appreciate and cherish about this experience. And um, so I, I got it. Oh, and uh, I've got a shout out. Um, the uh, creator, showrunner, Spirit Ranger, Carissa Valencia. She's a genius Shumash animation writer. She's doing great stuff. She put this team together and she's really created a great space for us to, you know, I think make some cool stuff. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, working on this uh, series with an all native writing team, it means a lot to you. Yeah, it's uh, like we, we throw the word um, special around a lot kind of like in the writer's room and that like this really just does feel like a special experience. Um, you, like for me personally, you know, if, if you'll notice on the, um, the deadline announcement for the show, um, we have the blessings of the Shumash tribe and the Cowlitz tribe um, to uh, uh, kind of, uh, we have the blessings of the Shumash tribe and the Cowlitz tribe to kind of create the show and to create a lot of these characters. So I'm Cowlitz. What that means is I, uh, went to my tribal council and like pitched to them the idea of potentially having a Cowlitz character in the show. And um, my tribal council was completely on board for it. And like, that's something that's like, not just like professionally cool, but also just like personally and culturally, like probably one of my top five, not just like career moments, but like life moments to get to do that. And to be able to kind of like, you know, bring not just my people and my stories, but, you know, uh, like other folks, other tribes, like, you know, stories and things like that kind of like into the mainstream. So I'd say that, you know, we're well, all we're, comedy writers making goofs, but like the ability to kind of tell our stories is just like an added thing that makes it five million times more cool, you know? Right. So um, we're really looking forward to the seeing the series. When can, when can we actually start watching it? And without giving too much away, kind of give us a synopsis. Uh, oh, yeah, totally. So um, Spirit Rangers is a fantasy adventure preschool series following Native American sibling trio Kodiak, Summer, and Eddie Skyseeder, who have a shared secret. They're Spirit Rangers. Spirit Rangers can transform into their own animal spirit to help protect the national park that they call home. And um, once again, the show is created by Carissa Valencia. She's uh, an amazing Shumash uh, writer, and uh, she's showrunning the show, and she's great. Um, 
the uh, release date, uh, I would say, um, let's see, uh, how do I say this without getting fired by Netflix? <laughs> uh, it's uh, usually when shows are announced, it's kind of when they're closer to the start of their production than the end of their production. So, you know, it, the show's definitely currently in production right now. So release date, I would say uh, TBD, but, you know, it'll be, it'll be out soon and we'll be dropping news and stuff about it as, as we progress. Okay. Are there any res dogs making an appearance? Um, uh, okay. Uh, no, no, com no comment. <laughs> okay. Well, we really appreciate you being here and we look forward to that. So keep in touch and we'll let our viewers know when they can start watching this series on Netflix. Of course. So thank you so much for joining us, Joey Cliff. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having me. And, um, uh, for the record, uh, I love res dogs. Res dogs are great. <laughs> Very good. And thank you for watching. Uma umu katsi ukalyani. Take care of yourselves. Your life is precious. I'm Patty Thonghungba. Join us again tomorrow. Indian Country Today is recorded at the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center in Phoenix, Arizona. This is Indian Country Today.